Everybody comfortable and set with your breakfast and some drinks, if not, to help yourself over there to whatever it is that you need. Um, I think I met everyone, but again, I'll just tell you that my name is Stacy Rolfe, and I am joined today with my daughter, Belle, who a lot of you see running up and down our driveway with Martha. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Marie is here helping out. She's in charge of Handsome. A lot of you see, if you follow our stories, he's our puppy that just got neutered yesterday. So he's, um, Marie is babysitting him for the, for the morning. And then Dr. Hoover is here from Mid Rivers. And um, Mark Hunter is here um, as our farrier and going to talk to you about uh, corrective feet and, and how to take care of them. So uh, I'm going to go through a little bit about, let's see if this up any better. I'd like to go through a little bit about um, just general miniature horse care and um, you know just kind of let you know that when we first got our horses we were in the process of building our house. This was all just raw land and so we had a lot of time on our hands before the horses were to come home. And um, so during that time, you know, we had full-size horses, but my daughter had said, Mom, why don't we get a miniature horse? To which I said, that would be fun. And, um, and this is the result of what happened with that little fun statement. <laughs> so, so I do always kind of point the finger at her. And so what happened was when Belle started looking around for a couple of minis, actually just one, I, um, she said, you know, found a couple, and there were, there were two that were being sold together on Craigslist, and I only wanted one, but I thought, okay, you know, we could have two. And when we got them, they were two years old, and we were their fourth owner. So, you know, right away, we think and wonder where have these horses been living and, and why are they going to different people so frequently? And the reason happens to kind of fall along the lines of us coming up towards Easter, and a lot of people get little bunnies to put in baskets for their kids. They're awfully cute, and you think that it's going to be fun. And the reality is really very different. And we have one of those little bunnies, not an Easter one, but I can tell you that's a whole other seminar on how much more bunnies are. Um, but, yes, um, So, you know, miniature horses, once kind of the cuteness wears off like a puppy and the work sets in, a lot of people choose not to do it. And so they, you know, shuffle them off, sell them. And what we try to explain to people is that Quite often what happens to these horses is then as they're going from you to you to you to you, they're getting different food, most likely every step along the way, they're getting different care, they're getting different treatment, and things happen to the horse. And they become afraid, or they become very um, bold, or they become, um, you know, whatever it is, if they're territorial, if they act out, if their behavior is a problem. Well, now I'm saying, I don't want this horse. I didn't know it bites. I didn't know it's gonna kick me. I didn't know I couldn't catch it. So it goes on to the next person. And so it's like a tumbleweed and they just gain all these you know, bad habits. And so a lot of these, these horses that are miniature um, end up in this kind of this really sad life long history of going from owner to owner. Um, so that's really why we try to do the barn tours that we do, and uh, and that's why, let me tell you, if, if somebody was offering a seminar when we got our first two, um, I would have been all for it. Because what happened was we bought those two about two years before our barn was done. And so we boarded them. And I thought, oh, great, you know, they'll figure out about how to take care of them and they'll get them, you know, good and, and all of this stuff. Well, just about every barn around this perimeter is mostly show barns that we have around here. So show barns are a very busy barn. Um, they have a lot of horses to take care of. 
and they're not necessarily interested in miniature horses, okay? So it was, we were lucky enough that we could find one that would take two. Um, even though they took two, do they have the time that those guys needed? And I really wasn't aware of what they needed to start their socializing and getting them off on the right start. Um, so things just kind of continued that way. We had those two. Six weeks later, the gal that I bought them from called me. She's at an auction. There's a mini with a baby. They're going to sell them separate, blah, blah, blah. That's how we kept getting all of these horses. And when you board a horse and you're at one of these show bars, you can have all the horses in the world. And we have a lot. Um, it doesn't mean you know how to take care of a horse. It means nothing. It means that you, you can go out there and ride the horse and you can have a great time, but it doesn't mean you know how to take care of the horse. The people that run the barns know how to take care of the horse. They know what they're feeding it, they know what their turnout is, they know what to do when they get sick. You as the owner rely on them. That's just the way barns work. So, so when we finally had the barn ready to bring horses home, I honestly, um, I think I put a picture in here. That's, that's the trailer that, that I bought. And um, I said a little prayer. <laughs> you know, like, please help me take care of these horses right. Because I didn't know what I was doing. And my husband was like, okay, we're just going to have the vet come over like once a week and they'll check on the horses and make sure they're okay. And we were like, okay. So, um, <laughs> so we were very nervous because we were very uneducated about how to take care of them. So I hope for those of you that either have miniature horses or if you're thinking about getting miniature horses, I hope that this is going to give you a better foundation with yours than I have with mine. Okay, because I tried to do reading and I tried to understand what I was getting myself into. And even the barns, and we had two that we were boarding them at, even the barn owners were like, okay, I know they're different. I know minis are different. So I'm going to talk to a friend of mine that has one. So they're not the same as a full size horse, they're not cared for in the same way. So, um, Okay, there's, there's a lot that we could cover, and in a very short amount of time, we're not going to get to at all. But, you know, just some of the basics are that if you get a horse of any size, you have to have some shelter for it. You have to have a place for it to live. You can't just think, I have a backyard, and, um, you know, my house protects it. That doesn't work. So you have to think about what you're going to give to your horse, whether it's going to have a complete stall where it comes in, out of bed weather, or it comes in at night, or you have a, a run-in shelter where it's like a three-sided um, structure that can keep them out of the rain and such. Um, you know, what are you going to do? And a lot of people, this is a size that I have heard somebody keeps a mini in a four by five. Okay, so that's really, really small. Even though these are small horses, they need room to lay down, they need room to stretch. I mean, if they're confined to their stall for any length of time for bad weather, you know, just think about how much, uh, how difficult that would be. So, you know, and they kind of go up from here. Five by seven, six by eight, and eight by 10 is probably a generous size for, you know, a horse to be in. Um, ours are 12 by 12s, but we keep two in there. So, and they both, they, they have plenty of room to lay down. We actually have one stall when I brought home a 19 year old mare from an auction um, that she was so small and I have two very small, they're under 30 inches, that they can all comfortably stay together in that stall. So you have to think about your room, your space allotment and where you're gonna put these horses. Um, something like this, even these barns or sheds that you can buy at Lowe's or some of these shed dealers, you can get them a pretty good size. This is a really, um, you know, quote unquote, inexpensive way to do it um, <coughs> because they'll have these in eight by 10, eight by 12 or whatever. And I actually found ourselves in need of more space that I didn't want to, 
I actually had no desire to add on to our barn. So I went to one of these um, shed dealers, knocked down to Lowe's or Home Depot, and I talked to them about customizing the size. And so we ended up with a nice size, um, I think it's a 12 by 18, that we have three bigger size minis that live in. And, um, and so that was a, a you know, least expensive way that we could go. And then I added in electricity and we were able to put in fans and lights and, uh, and, and made it livable. So that's actually their little barn. So when you do this, you can customize how many windows you want, how big you want the windows, if you want Dutch doors. And so that's an option, you guys, to think about if, when the, the expense of a big barn kind of could be overwhelming. There are other options that you can do for these little guys and, uh, and make it quite um, roomy and, and livable for them. Okay, so you also need to figure out where you're going to store your feed and your hay. Um, these products are all of our feed containers. They're big, they're heavy, but they are completely rodent-proof, and that's really um, that's really important. You don't want to have mice in there. You don't want to have bugs in there. So these things were expensive. I believe I got them from either Schneider or State Line Tax, something like that. Um, but they are worth their weight in gold. So something like that um, is is really helpful. The other thing too that goes along with feed is that um, a lot of times uh, the word scoop is very much left to your own imagination, okay? I, I, get, I get a scoop in the morning and I get a scoop in the evening. Okay, so let me just tell you what a scoop looks like. This is a scoop. This is a scoop. Um, these over here are all scoops. So how much are you giving your horse? Okay, because take it from us, there's nothing that's more difficult than getting weight off of a horse. And so get yourself um, underneath where the bagels are, I have a scale. Get yourself a scale and weigh your food. And then you will know exactly how much your horse is supposed to have. Your vet should be able to help you out with how much your horse should be eating. But this is our little guys, okay? This is their morning and this is their evening scoop. That's it. Um, so don't let a scoop be a scoop, all right? Figure out what is really right for your horse. Um, hay storage is, is another thing. I'll just throw this out there. When I was building the barn, I really went into a lot of research with um, hay, safety, storage, everything. And of course, the number one cause of barn fires, I'm afraid to tell you, is because of hay. So I knew I did not want to use the upper loft level for hay, which I had originally planned on. And then that created all kinds of more problems. Well, now where am I going to put it? So we actually have a separate feed barn, and underneath it is like a garage. It's like a two-car garage, and that's where we store our hay. So have a place that you can put your hay, um, even if it's going to be another one of those, you know, less expensive metal barns, you know, you can use that as your hay barn. Some people just cover them with tarp, always put them on a pallet, keep them raised and off the ground. Um, if you put them in an enclosed area, make sure that you're leaving plenty of space along the sides and the top. You're not filling it to the brim. You don't want to have, um, you know, mold get on your, your hay bales and such. So. You have to figure out, it's not just the horse, where am I gonna put it? Where am I gonna put the food? Where am I gonna put the hay? Um, so for a while, we ended up keeping our hay when we first started in an extra stall that we had until we had our feed barn ready. So just make sure you figure out what you're doing with it. Um, okay, so miniature horses come in different sizes. And a miniature horse is really defined by its side. There's two different registries that will register a miniature horse. So if you are one that you want to show your horse, you're either going to be a part of the American Miniature Horse Registry, 
or the American Miniature Horse um, Association. Both have two different height requirements. One's 38, I think one's 34. Yeah, this one's 34. So um, places like the Tack Trunk or Gold Horseshoe or any of the places around here will sell a measurement stick that you can actually measure how tall your horse is. They are measured by the last hair at the wither. That's where you start to measure them, down to the ground. Um, so I'm not talking a whole lot about these registries because most people don't show their horses, but if you do, just know that there are two that are out there uh, for registries. And a lot of people have fun with them. You know, they show them, there's halter classes and there's confirmation and they have a lot of fun with them. So people think, you know, what do you do with them? Well, there's a whole group of people out there that are showing these horses and they're having a lot of fun. Um, so that's just an option that's out there. This particular, if you can see the image behind it with a ribbon on it, that belongs to Milton. He's our donkey that we uh, adopted from Longmeadow. And his particular ribbon has, um, he was awarded that he did not cry at dinner. So <laughs> that's what we do with our horses. <laughs> okay, so you can also do therapy work. And therapy work is a whole nother ball of wax that um, you need to know if you have the right horse for it. And I have 23 horses up in the barn. There's been a number of them that I have thought would be great for therapy. A couple that have been with us since birth. And they couldn't be further from being the right kind of horse for therapy. So I have a lot of disappointments up there that I thought I'd be able to use. But that's okay. They're great horses. They're just not cut out for therapy. So don't get yourself all bummed out if your horse just doesn't have the temperament. Okay, they're still great horses, but they just may not be the kind that can go into a nursing home or into a classroom setting because of patients or something like that. And one of ours that we have uh, certified for therapy, he is actually probably on his morph out of that kind of work. The older he has gotten, and he's now 20 years old, the older he has gotten, the less tired he has become. And his patience level is waning. And so the only time that I can use him now with um, any kind of groups of people is when it's pretty active, okay? When it's in a moving environment or when he's outside, maybe he can graze, um, but close quarters of a nursing home, he's really not interested in standing there and being pet too much anymore. That's okay, you know, you have, to, you have to listen to what your horse is telling you. These are different places that you can get your horse um, um, certified is a very loose word, okay? So therapy horses are still very uncontrolled in this world, but Pet Partners offers a good program. American Miniature Therapy Horse Association offers a good program. Seven Oaks Farms, um, they offer a, a, a kit that you can go online. It's a video I think you download that can help you with uh, working with your with your horse. They're in Ohio. You can also you know travel and go to one of their courses that they offer. So there's all different ways that you can get your horse, um, you know into a good working environment. I will also say that there's there's a big difference, you guys, between a therapy horse and a service horse, mm -hmm. because there are very few horses that are out there that are actually legitimately service horses. And service horses are used for people who have disabilities. Maybe they need it for stability, they need it for um, you know walking or, or, or something along those lines. And here you've got a big, you know, maybe they have a, near 300 pound horse that can offer them the stability from a handler standpoint way better than a dog could. And so there are those horses that are out there that are used as a service animal. Therapy is strictly for um, uh, going in uh, to a nursing home, going into a classroom. They're not providing any physical help to anyone, but they give a lot of good emotional therapy when um, seniors can pet a horse and it kind of awakens those memories to, um, you know, when they were younger and they may have had a horse on their own. So don't get the two confused. Don't think that you're going to start traveling with your horse once it's certified for therapy and you're going to get on a plane because those regulations are all changing as well. 
and um, it's service animals that are the ones that provide a real job. Okay, so again, how do you know if your horse is right for therapy? Well, size is a big thing, okay? Because if you're going into something like an assisted living home, not everyone who lives in assisted living has the ability to come out into maybe where the living room area is, and you have to go into their room. So if your horse is really big and bulky and you know more athletic, it may not be appropriate to go into these really small quarters or to maneuver around wheelchairs or um, you know walkers. So think about the size that you have. Think about the personality. Okay, if you think well, he's, he's awesome, only every now and then is he a little mouthy. Well, you can't have a little bit of a mouthy horse around anyone. They have to be really rock solid with their manners. Um, obstacle work is something that if your horse, when you work through this program and if you can get it around tight quarters, it's not going to get scared, it's not going to mind if something rubs against it, it's not going to worry that there's a fan or there's a drain or anything else. Um, that all goes along with the unusual environments. Noise tolerance, you know, a lot of times you never know when someone's um, meal cart is going to tip, spill, something's going to drop on the floor. And if your horse is one that's going to spook when these things happen, you can continue to work with it to try to desensitize it. But these are all things that a horse has to be able to successfully navigate walking around. Um, in you know in all of these situations and easy visits okay so a lot of times people when you go see them in a nursing home or something they have all the time in the world and they're not going to rush this visit so for us i know when i go in i know what our time limit is with our horses it's pretty short quite honestly it's not we're not going to be there for two hours we're going to be there for under an hour and then we're going to leave the horse only has a certain amount of capacity to be going around and petting, and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm done. You have to read your horse, and sometimes you'll have to say, we're gonna to have to cut this visit a little short. Um, and then again, you're also going to want, you're not going to be the only person that is doing these visits. There will be two of you, so make sure you've got a, a partner to go on these visits with you. Somebody who's at the head of the horse, somebody who's at the back of the horse, okay? You wanna make sure somebody's watching where those four feet are at all time and not stepping on someone who's wearing slippers. You wanna make sure that you're in control of where the horse's head is. Um, so that's a, a, you know, a bit of an overview of what you have to think about if you are looking at doing therapy. Um, you know, and I've already gone over this as far as, um, different types of, of initial training ideas, sounds, plastic bags. Horses are notoriously afraid of plastic, plastic bags. If you can wave them, if you can let a balloon fly in the air, if they can walk through pool noodles that are hanging, if they have really the strong sense of who they are, that these things don't scare them, then chances are you can continue to work forward with your horse for, um, for therapy. Um, so, you know, being around little kids, we do, you know, Girl Scout presentations. We help them earn their pet badges. Banks will come out and, and be with everybody for these things. Um, okay, so this is a big thing uh, when it comes to grass and miniature horses. There are literally two schools of thought on this. There are those that leave their horses on grass, their minis on grass, and there are those that don't, okay? And I'm not here to say that one is right and one is wrong. You have to figure out what's right for your horse. We happen to prescribe to the leave them on um, a dry lot. We do not give our horses grass. Uh, we give our horses grass in very limited quantities, I'll say that, okay? so. Grass has a lot of sugar in it. It has more sugar in it different times of the day. It has more or less sugar in it different times of the year. So if your horse is going to be one that is on grass, start to understand photosynthesis, start to understand the sugar that that's, uh, spikes in grass during the day or um, during different times of the year. So for our horses, we do give them grass, but it's in the winter. 
because of the winter, the sugars are the lowest in grass and they get grass one hour, once a week. So they do get it, but we control it really, really um, well. We've played with it. We've, give, we've gone as far as giving them grass three times a week for an hour at a time. And um, we find ourselves with heavy horses. And so um, I believe Dr. Hoover, you could probably chime in when you went to some seminar, they told you a, a variance of how much a, a full-size horse can consume versus a miniature horse in the same amount of time or an hour's worth of time. It was, they did research and it said that a miniature horse could eat the same amount of calories in an hour as a thoroughbred horse needs in a day. Well, there you go. Oh, wow. In an hour versus the big horse being outside grazing and that's a thoroughbred. So you really have to consider what's, um, what camp you're going to be in. And let me tell you, I was also very disappointed about that when we were going to bring the horses home because I had visions in my head of these horses out here on this grass, beautiful, how fun is that going to be? And Dr. Hur was like, um, no, no, no. So we had to come up with dry lots and then grass is um, a bonus that they get. Yeah. What is your base of your dry lot? The base of the dry lot is basically um, sand and something that's called minus, which is a very, very fine, gritty gravel. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's that's grass. So that's that's a look at our dry lots. So they're large enough that they can run around in, they can play, uh, they have a good time and um, manure is picked up every day that's out there. You don't want to have it sitting. Um, if, you, if you don't realize that, but obviously manure attracts flies, it attracts bugs, and <coughs> you want to keep that stuff away from your horse. So the more frequently you can pick up your manure, the better off your horse is going to be. Okay, so that's just a picture of, you know, they do get grass and, and uh, we're not bad guys. We do let them have grass. Okay, but this is boot camp. So that when, when they did get too heavy, and we also um, decided to invest in a scale, um, a, a large heavyweight scale. And I was originally, I had talked to a lot of barn owners before, you know, and in the process of building our barn, about <coughs> what, to, um, what to do, what to have, how to do the drains, all this stuff. And I was um, told I didn't need a scale. And um, so I didn't buy a scale. But once we started to really have uh, horses that were getting fat, I bought a scale. And that's Val, of course, running with Stanley, because we had to try to get weight off. We had to try to get weight off the horses. And that was by getting them moving. So, um, so it's, a lot, it's a lot of work. I mean, there, here she goes, Bambi. Up the driveway. Look at how heavy Bambi was at that time. So, you know, grass can really wreak havoc with um, with your horses and their weight. There she goes with Mr. Chopper. So, um, so just know that, um, that grass can really add weight to your horse. Heavy horses cause problems. Heavy minis cause health issues. And if you can do whatever you can to try to avoid those health issues, the better off you're going to be, the better off your horse is going to be. So I have found that a scale has really been invaluable because anytime there's medicine that needs to be dosed, we know exactly how much our horses weigh. Anytime there's a change in feed, we know exactly how much our horses weigh. When our horses feel a little bit on the lighter side, we can get them on and we can think, okay, maybe they need to put on. 15 pounds or whatever it may be or when we get a new horse in and it's really underweight and we know exactly where our starting point is and, and where we're going so if you can I just ordered one off of Amazon um, you know they're, they're just large scales and they're they're fairly low to the ground it's just a platform scale that they step on and I, I would recommend them for sure okay so um, you, everybody knows that, that there's two things that always grow on a horse. One is their feet and the other is their teeth. 
So making sure that your, your horse get their teeth checked and um, get floated on a regular basis is really important. You may not even be aware if this isn't something that's happening in your, in your own program at home, you may not even be aware that your horse is losing weight because you're like, well, I see it eating. Well, maybe it's chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing, but those teeth are a problem and they need filing and the horse is having a hard time even though you see it chewing its hay. So making sure that you get your horse's dental work done is really important. Uh, okay, so where to buy or adopt a mini. There's a lot of places that you can go to. Um, Craigslist has them all the time, a dime a dozen. And we always tell people that, you know, just because they're on Craigslist and someone's selling them, that doesn't mean that you're getting a healthy horse, doesn't mean you're getting a cared for horse. So a lot of these are in need of a good home. Long Meadow Rescue Ranch, we have seven horses that we've adopted from them. That's the Humane Society and Union. Kay, sitting in the back, she's got one or two. I got one. One from, from Long Meadow. So they constantly have full size horses and they will also get in mini. So that's also another place to check. Um, Randy's Rescue Ranch, I've never been out there. I believe it's in Illinois, but is it? So they also have um, ranch animals, farm animals, private buyers. You can always just you know find somebody selling them. Facebook groups, there's always um, horses for sale on Facebook 24 seven. Okay, so this is something that actually was a real ad that was online. It says, are you looking for a miniature? Want to get one cheap? We're selling raffle tickets for $2 each or get six for 10. You get your choice of mare, gelding, or stallion. So this is kind of the mentality that's out there, you guys. And that's all the people that are not in this room. That's the people that think that miniature horses are really very disposable. Um, they think that they are, are a, a kind of horse that can be traded for, you know, half a dozen goats, some sheep, maybe a small tractor, whatever. So their, their value is really very low in life with a vast majority of people. So, um, and you can see, to raffle off a horse, anyone in the world, no care of whether they have a place to put it or know how to take care of it or what their commitment level is, that's all fine. It's just a, you know, sell them up. Um, this is a, another little guy that was on Craigslist, okay? He's 14 years old, says he's very gentle. Um, right here, what we highlighted is she would be the perfect beginner pony for leading little cowboys or cowgirls for them to learn balance and basics of care. She would be great for a petting zoo, backyard pet, birthday party, or just a little one to love. So before you leave here today, if you're thinking about your mini is going to be great for your kids or your grandkids, you know, what I want you to know about that is that, you know, all horses can carry a certain percentage of their body weight, 20%. So if a miniature horse is, let's just say it's 200 pounds, that's 40 pounds that they can carry. That's a really, really small child. It's not a six-year-old, it's not an eight-year-old. It's a really, really small child. And then when you add their tack onto it, you know, what you're looking at is um, more like a two-year-old, quite honestly, to fit on a 200-pound horse. So before you leave here, I have a saddle that uh, I want you to feel because this is a saddle that came with one of our horses who was a um, petting zoo, little traveling riding horse. This is the saddle that came with him. Uh, it weighs 19 pounds. It weighs 19 pounds. He weighs 215. So when we had a little toddler day out here one day for Martha, I weighed the kids. And it was a two-year-old that weighed 21 pounds. That's who could fit on banks with this and not be too heavy for him. So pick this up so that you understand how, um, how heavy a saddle can actually add into that weight. 
uh, for a horse. Um, let's see what they say about this one. Miniature horse for barter today only. Um, he's not fixed. Must be able to prove that he will have shelter if needed. Okay, okay so you guys, most people that own these horses, I'm just going to cast a big wide net out there. There's a lot of Hoosiers that own these horses. Okay? <laughs> they think they're cute. Captain Cooper's like, I'm not associated with them. <laughs> 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 you guys, they just, they just don't know. So, um, so that's kind of the big thing out there with with these horses. Okay, this cute little girl that Belle would not let me get um, was a little. Pony, right? Yeah. You can see her feet. You can see all the cracks in her feet. Um, you know, I, that's someone that she's adorable, but chances are she was sold to someone who's like, oh my gosh, she's so cute, and she's got a saddle, we can ride her, and all of that. And that's, you know, that's not the way to be. This is what, this is what it looks like when you go to carnivals. Quite often these horses are on these, these carousels. A rather dreary, sad life that these guys have to live with. They're chained right there to the post, so we're not fans of pony rides. Um, okay, so so this is also something you need to know. If you don't already have a mini and you're thinking about getting one, it's always buyer beware. You will never know what you're really getting, okay, no matter who the owner is. Um, you should assume that any mare that you get is pregnant. Just assume that. Um, you don't know if they've been in a field. You don't know where they've really been. And then if you, if once you get your horse, you should be getting it checked out, checked out immediately. Okay, within the first few days, certainly within the first week, have your vet come out and check it. If you uh, are suspicious at all that it is pregnant, they can do a test. I don't know if an ultrasound is the only way you can test for pregnancy, or is that the only sure way? It depends on their size. I mean, most things, if, if they're not too small, I can ultrasound them, and that's usually the fastest, and you get your answer the quickest, and you know for sure. Okay. There's blood tests also. Okay. But most have an ultrasound. Okay, great. All right. So, and then your mini should also be quarantined. So, make sure you've got that in mind. Where can you put it? For 30 days before you bring it in with maybe the little guy that you already have or before you bring it into your beautiful barn that you've just built and now you just brought in some disease so keep it separate for 30 days make sure it's healthy and you'll be way better off in the long run um, don't let the real condition scare you off okay because what you see in a picture may not be what you actually get okay they may have used an old picture and then what you really get are two different things. Um, okay, so case in point. This is what Banks looked like when we saw his picture on Facebook. And I kept asking the person if she could send me anything else, and she was always so busy. He was the pair, uh, petting zoo carousel pony. Could you send me anything else? She would never send me anything else. He looks pretty good there. This is the reality of what we got. Okay, he came from Arkansas. This is what he looked like the day we got him. He stepped off a trailer. This is the condition that his coat was in. He was completely chewed up by the bigger ponies that he lived with. And those are all the bite marks of them um, because he was so small. So the person that we got him from, I asked her, did you bring any of his feet? No, I forgot. Give me a say. I forgot. So, you know, right away, you're dealing with people that have a less than loving interest in the future of this horse, okay? It's another generalization. But to make the horse come off of, if it's getting sweet feed, and to get it onto proper nutrition, you still want to lengthen that out until you can switch it over, just like you would do your dog. Okay, 10 days or so, two weeks. So these horses go from, boom, I ate one thing this morning, I'm getting something different tonight. And that can also start to create some problems while they're at home. Um, 
GI systems are, are different in a mini. And um, so you want to do everything very gradually. Okay, so after we were able to get him cleaned up and take care of him and get his teeth done, his feet done, and, and his, healthy, uh, his health back together, Banks became a, a therapy horse. This is also another picture of one of our horses that we got from an auction. Uh, she's the one that was with a baby that they were going to separate. She looked pretty bratty to me. And, um, and I knew at that time I wanted to have her. But, you know, she's not a very cute horse. She's not very pretty. And she's got a little boy whose feet are almost touching the ground on her. So I asked this person, she's about six hours away, I said, if you'll just outbid anyone, I'll take them both, her and her baby. And that was seven years ago that we've, that we've had them. But this is what it looks like today. So, you know, these horses are very much like dogs at the Humane Society. And they can be in the worst shape, they can have their worst behavior in that environment or in an auction environment because they're scared. And then bring them home and let them kind of exhale and breathe a little bit and, um, and start working. So don't let those, you know, when you get a horse and if it's different than what you saw, don't let that scare you too much. Molly is another situation. Molly was something that I bought off of Craigslist as well. She was in Illinois on a breeding farm, and when we brought her home, I was boarding her at a barn because we still weren't ready. And um, within the first week, I got a call from the barn owner telling me that I was going to have to find alternate housing for her, that she was just too dangerous because she was a kicker. And so she would, uh, like most donkeys, you know, when they get scared, they kick and they are fast in both back feet. So I did, I had to find a new place for Molly to live for almost two years before we got her. Even though I knew, you know, once I got her home, it would just be a matter of time. Somebody just has to spend the time with this little, little donkey and that's me hugging her. And that's really what it took. I want to say that's all it took because it took a long time for her not to be fearful, but that is what it took. Um, okay, so when you decide if you do get one or if you have one, how many do you have? One, two, or, or more than that. You have how many you can commit to. How many can you personally take care of? If you have so many that you need help, are you willing to hire someone to come in and help clean stalls or whatever? So how many can you yourself commit to? One, I think, is a rather lonely life for a mini. Okay, they are herd animals, and so if you can financially afford two, I would say that that is really a nice magical number of cattle. Um, so think about your space, think about how much time you have, and think about your financial commitment because these horses, you know, they're expensive. Um, but there's just a picture of two. I mean, so, so any two that you have are going to be buddies. Um, so this is how easy it is for us when we do introduce a horse to each other. We don't just say, open the gate, here's your new stall, you're ready, here's your new partner. Um, I went down to Lowe's and I just bought one of these gates and we just wired it in at, at the edges of the stall and we let uh, Molly and Banks live like that for about a week. And once they were able to understand that, oh, you know, he seems fine, she seems fine, we didn't see any bad activity through the, through the fence, we were ready to put them together and we did and, and uh, Molly, who is our most fearful animal in the barn um, literally has a, a heartbreaking wail whenever Banks leaves the barn to go on a therapy visit. So he's been a great therapy horse for her to have and help her <laughs> come up in life. Um, uh, Stacey, yeah. Question. I have an adult horse and I'm wanting to get a, a mini for a companion horse. Mm -hmm. Is that a good idea? And Big running shed, big yeah. running uh, 
kind of like the grass and the no grass. You're going to get people who say, my mini lives with my big horse and it's fine. And you're going to get those that are say, it's fine until it's not. And until there's an issue. And until if a friendly, playful kick hurts, hurts the mini. So I personally, I, I personally wouldn't do it, but that's me. So I can only tell you that horses are horses. They play and they can play rough and they can all get spooked and they can all do things that are crazy, that are unpredictable. So, you know, you have to know what the risks are that are involved. Um, we don't even let Martha or Booker, who are miniature horses, they're so small in size, we don't even let them with our minis for the same reason I don't want them to get hurt. So you have to make that decision on your own. Um, Dr. Hoover may have more to say for that too, I don't know, do you? No, I agree with that. I mean, yeah. I think it's one of those things, because I do have clients that have them together and the mini goes first. I mean, the mini takes charge and the big horses keep the business. Right, but I do think you have to, I mean, it is a little horse and a big horse, and accidents do happen. And I think that's just one of those things that, yeah, it's all good until something happens, but that's not to say that it may not work for you, and they may do fine. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> uh, okay, so these are just some tidbits that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with. One is to blanket or not. Um, all of our full-size horses are show horses, so they get clipped regularly all year round. They're, they don't have much on them to protect them, so they get blankets, and you'll see full-size horses out all around town wearing blankets when it's cold. When our horses go out, you'll see them completely bare because we don't clip them uh, beyond the summer. And so they get really fuzzy, they get really furry, and that keeps them warm. If we were to toss a blanket on them, it can stunt that hair growth. And we want them to be as insulated with their own hair as possible. So we don't put blankets on ours. We do, okay, so we do do it for fun. When we want to have cute pictures, we'll put blankets on all the horses. But um, we also do it for a few of our, kind of our special needs horses. So like Emma, who's, who's just got her own special needs. Chloe, we have about three that we put blankets on and we put them on the dwarfs. Um, know it's normal for your horse. That was the biggest, scariest phrase that anyone said to me when we were bringing the horses home from, from the last farm. They're like, well, you'll know your horse. And I'm like, well, no, I won't know the horse. I won't know what's normal. I won't know if it's laying down out of comfort or pain. I won't know that. And that scared the heck out of me. The word colic sent shivers down my spine. I didn't even know what it was. So you have to know when your horse is laying down and it's resting and it's enjoying the sun and it's even laying flat out and it's really enjoying a sunny afternoon versus when your horse is sick. Is it laying down? Is it rolling? Is it looking at its sides? Is it, is it trying to lick? Is it, is it getting up and down? Is it swishing its tail? Are all these things normal or not normal? And you'll have to understand how to read your horse. Um, security cameras can also give you a great peace of mind and they are basically a dime a dozen. We have an uh, extensive security system around here. And I will tell you that the additional security cameras that we've added are the cheap ones that we get at Lowe's, and I like them better. So if you can get like a Nest camera or something like that, put it in the stall, it will give you a peace of mind. Whether you think my horse has been a little wonky today or I'm not quite sure, you want to keep an eye on it at all times, that's a great way to do it. These cameras maneuver all around the stall very easily. They um, rewind very easily. So you can really check on your horse um, and, and have uh, an idea of what's going on, even if you're traveling or middle of the night, storm blows in, you know, oh God, is the horse okay? You can really check a lot of things about these guys. Um, okay, so this is just a, and I can give you all of this information. These are some of the equine vets that um, that are around in the area. Um, we are e extremely blessed that we have as many equine vets in this area that we do. I'm on a lot of forums, you guys might be too. There are people who are in the middle of nowhere <clears throat> that don't have access to either an equine vet 
or an equine vet with mini experience. <coughs> Excuse me, those are two very different things. So you'll wanna ask your vet what experience they have with miniature horses. They're not dosed the same, they're not treated the same. A lot of the instruments that they have don't work for miniature horses. Am I right, Dr. Hoover? It's different. Yeah, it's different. It's different. Um, okay, farriers, um, we're also very lucky. There's way more farriers on here. These are just those that we're familiar with. So making sure that you have a good farrier and one that is willing to work with miniature horses because again, it's a different breed. They're small and they hurt backs, okay? So your farrier may not be willing to work on a, on a, <coughs> on a miniature horse. Totally understandable. So you may have to work hard to try to find one that's um, that's, you know, maybe younger, willing to do that, or, or <laughs> new to it, you know, and is willing to take on the business. So, okay, so hay suppliers. Hay is really a precious commodity. You know, once you find a hay supplier, I would also recommend that you get your hay tested. Okay, but learn from our mistakes. Once you get your hay tested, that does not mean, oh, we know what our NSC content is. We know how much, you know, protein. We know all these figures. You don't. You know what it is for that bale only. So if you end up having horses with health issues, you literally have to test every bale. That's pretty unreasonable to think of, but um, if you've got a horse that has metabolic issues, then you're gonna to wanna to look at hay that is more cubed and in a bag that does have a guaranteed analysis on it. But just for your own peace of mind to know what your hay is, what it really contains, you would have to drill like six holes within the, within the um, bale itself and uh, send that off to like the extension office or a lab that is going to test it. Um, know how much hay your horse should be getting and know that a flake is not a flake. Some flakes are fat, some flakes are very lean, some flakes are very light. So again, a scale is going to tell you how much your flake weighs and how much your horse should be getting because they, they get one and a half percent basically to or up to two percent I think of their body weight daily. Um, and then we talked about the storage. Um, okay so this is just some tips and, and all of this is going to be on our website too so you can always come back to this and type of hay that you get. So when we feed our horses our hay we don't just toss the flake in there. We actually go over, we have hay nets, and we actually shake it out and fluff the hay down. And when you do that, you see exactly what's in that, that flake. And this can be in there. So make sure that you really don't just get lazy and toss that hay out there and know what's inside your, your flakes because that hurts. The other day I had a deer like something. Oh. That's not surprising, but that's gross. So, um, so hay suppliers, if you want me to tell you, you know, like our hay supplier, I'm not. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can find uh, you can find a good hay supplier. Good luck with that. Um, tax supplies. Uh, we also there's so many places that you can get your tack and your needs filled all over the place. Um, this I like, you know, we started using it a couple years ago. It's a sleek ease, you may have seen this. It will take so much hair off your horse in the spring. It will just come off in droves. It's like a little sharp razor right here and it just will uh, really do the job. If you don't have clippers, you're not going to clip your horse. This will get the hair off. Um, okay, so these are just things to think about when it comes to how much is this horse going to actually cost. Your veterinary expense, that's probably going to be one of your bigger expenses, at least it is for us, because we have so many, okay. Um, your farrier trims, um, every six weeks, unless you've got a horse that has special needs, maybe a four weeks or three weeks or whatever. Um, shavings, we buy our shavings in bags, we buy it by the bulk, it's $4 a bag. Uh, hay, you can pay anywhere, in what we hear in this area is 16, 6 to $14 a bale. Um, your feed, 
uh, anywhere from $24 to $28 a bag. Tax supplies can add up. Fencing, of course, can be a big expense. Your barn, water, electricity, all these things are just some food for thought when it comes to the expenses. Um, okay, so know when to call your vet. And um, Dr. Hoover knows that I will pretty much text her anytime I am unsure about anything that's going on with the horse. Um, we also, even though we have a great level of comfort now with taking care of our horses, I still do not feel comfortable with doing anything without her uh, permission, okay? So I don't run it like, oh yeah, we gave him some, you know, some bandamine this morning. I won't even give our horses bandamine without her saying so. Um, I'm not going to really go into this because you are, unless you want me to show this, what it looks like. Well, you can show what it looks like, okay. just briefly. So she'll talk about colic too. So this is an example of what a horse looks like when it is colicking. Um, which, by the way, taking a video of your horse and texting it to your vet can be very helpful, which is why I have these videos. So she doesn't look right. You can see the shavings in her already. Down she goes. <clears throat> and kicked out one leg, there's the roll. <clears throat> she doesn't look like she feels well. You can see that, she has kind of a droopiness about her. And um, <clears throat> that's an example of something where a horse does not feel well. <clears throat> Recognizing laminitis, I hope you guys never have to deal with it, but if you do, it is Basically, you can, uh, the symptoms, sorry, that's a blower. <clears throat> you can see Chloe is walking very gingerly, okay? She's not walking normally at first to take a step. There's a bit of rocking that will go on. The horse is not going to walk normally. It's going to walk like it hurts. This is choke, okay? So all these things we've had to deal with, you never know what's going to come your way. This is Milton, our donkey. Um, so he's trying to get up something. And he actually was able to clear it on his own. You can hear me in the background. I didn't know what I was doing. All I knew to do was try to keep him calm and try to keep myself calm. And so I talked quietly and just kept trying to reassure him that everything was okay. I was probably reassuring myself more. But I had, you know, sent this video to Dr. Hoover. And, um, and so videotaping what the horse is experiencing is a really great way for your vet to know. And, um, and then come out and you know assess the situation. Okay, this is how much we are. We're like, okay, is this the stuff you're talking about that I should put in his eye? And then, um, is this how much you want me to fill this room? So <clears throat> that's how that's how we are. Okay, I mean we know a lot now, but <clears throat> still, these are the things that are growing pains. That if you've never learned any of this, <clears throat> better safe than sorry. Uh, you know, just some of the whys. They're no different than you guys. Why do you have all these horses or why do you even have a miniature horse? They're a lot of fun and they give us a lot of, of pleasure. We love them and um, we take them for walks. We take them, um, <clears throat> that was during the, the trust phase of teaching Molly that no one's going to hurt her. But it's very gratifying when you work with some of these horses that come from, you know, a, a more difficult past or a sad life. Uh, to be able to bring them around and have them see that life is not so bad. That's Milton, you know, he used to live at the Humane Society and now he lives here. So you can give a, you can give a horse a really nice life and not do anything with them other than love them and have fun with them. We love to take pictures of our horses and, you know, spend some time outside with them. So um, that's that's it, you guys. That's what I want to share and impart with you, and I hope that that was helpful in, in what we do. Dr. Hoover is going to come up, and she's going to talk to you about um, some of the health issues and the, and the medical part of it all, okay?